Thanks. Thanks, Ben. <clears throat> um, does anyone recognize these figures? They are in the hallway here. <laughs> so these are probably a local uh, Native American tribe. And these arrows show the intraorbital width compared to the bizygomatic width. And that's indicative of ancestral infant feeding, um, something that had been discovered uh, in the 50s by uh, Weston Price and Pottinger. Um, they came up with that, the, the relationship. And I thought, wow, what, what better place uh, right, right here in the union building here. Can you hear me? I, I guess people are saying the mic wasn't uh, strong. Okay, the incredible shrinking face. If any of you are from my era, you know what movie that's based upon, that title. Uh, I'm, I am a visiting scholar in orthodontic. I'm working with one of the orthodontic faculty at the Museum of Anthropology. We're studying pre-industrial uh, skulls. Uh, I, I'm focusing on children, or what anthropologists call pre-adults. They've got funny names for things, like teeth that are Behind the canines are called post-canine teeth. We call them molars and premolars. Um, so anyway, this is the movie, The Incredible Shrinking Man. Uh, and that's, so that's how I came up with the title. <clears throat> What's interesting in French, uh, anyone speak French here? That, you know, the shrinking is retraction. And Mike Mew just gave a great talk. You probably were all there. I had to fight him to release his fan club to come into my room here. Uh, I'm one of his fans, too. Um, anyway, retraction is really uh, what it's all about in terms of therapy and in terms of what the problem is, what's been happening, why our face is getting smaller. Um, this is a talk I'm giving uh, in a week and a half in Salt Lake City with, we're hoping to be, will soon be a sister group of the Ancestral Health Society, the uh, International Society for Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health. Uh, and you know, I have to condense this talk down to 10 minutes for them. Um, but they want to see evidence for the hypothesis. So I'm going to show, Mike has some beautiful results. Uh, I, I encourage him to show some of his, more of his results next time, because they're awesome what he does for people. Um, and you're going to see some of my results as evidence for why we, um, and, and as Mike talked about, um, <clears throat> there's, there's general acknowledgement in orthodontics that uh, the cause of malocclusion is not Mendelian genetically modulated, which means, you know, a gene makes a trait, and it, it's, it's, it's an interaction between genes and environment, epigenetics. And I'm going to show you how if we use normative standards that are based upon a pre-industrial norm, we're going to produce better faces and better airways and healthier people. And I'm going to show that you can do it. I'm essentially trying to help my, and you have to start really young to do what's called orthotropics. Um, but you can help them turn into little Cro-Magnons. And it, that's really what it is. The Cro-Magnons were very beautiful people. Uh, and that's really the standards that, that we're trying to establish uh, for everybody to use. So the whole fact that faces are retracting, getting smaller, and not just faces, but jaws. And if faces and jaws are getting smaller, guess what else is getting smaller? The airway, okay? So we don't say craniofacial anymore. We say craniofacial respiratory. You cannot separate them. They are all connected. The back of the face is the airway. The front of the airway is the face. So that's the paradigm that Mike, myself, and others are trying to change. But so what? And, and that's what I work with Stephen Sheldon, who's a pediatric sleep medicine doctor in Chicago. And every time I bring up an idea, so what, Kevin? And it's up to me. So I, before I even talk to him now, I make sure I've got answers. Uh, why are human jawbones shrinking so rapidly on an evolutionary time scale? Um, Mike's dad, John Mew, often talks about the saddle angle from the base of the sphenoid to the cella tersica where your uh, pituitary sits. Tunisian, the junction of the forehead and the nose bone. And that angle there is getting smaller as the face is retracting. Now, from a phylogenetic standpoint, the brain was getting bigger and the face had to come back, but it wasn't out of proportion. Now, 
this is something that has exceeded the, the evolutionary time scale and it's accelerating rapidly. Teeth can't keep up with it. And the jaws, the jaw bones and, and the bony airway is also shrinking. Um, so this is a modern sample compared to uh, a pre-industrial sam sample. That's, uh, I think, Kennewick Man, who's the, the oldest, yeah, the oldest American from like, I don't know, 15, 18,000 years ago. Um, but as you can see, even as the face retracts, teeth don't necessarily get crooked. Because this happened phylogenetically over vast amounts of time. You know, since agriculture, the jaws, brains, our brains have gotten smaller too. But the teeth have kept up with it. They've shrunk just a little bit. And it's a term I learned from anthropologists. It's called allometry. It's, it's scaling proportionally. So what? Here's another paper, cephalometric comparison of skulls from the 14th and 16th centuries. Uh, again, looking at the bizygomatic and biorbital, um, but also... Um, this is a horizontal growth. It's not growing steeply. And this point right here, it's right under your nose. There's, there's a point to where you drop a line from where your nose and forehead come together and in a horizontal from your ear hole to, to under your orbit where your eye is. And um, almost nearly completely, 100% of thousands of skulls we've looked at, that A point is always in front of that line. But in modern skulls, it's not. Okay, almost every patient that Mike and I see, that that A point is behind that line. So to, to correct our patients to a cephalometric norm that's based upon uh, a non-modern sample, um, where are you going to get those numbers? And that's what we're trying to establish. SNA is uh, a measurement that most orthodontists use. That's cell where your uh, pituitary gland sits, the nasion to A point right here. And that number... Somewhere in the high 70s, low 80s, that's considered normal, depending on the age and uh, gender of the uh, person. But we're finding in our pre-industrial samples, they're almost always about 90 degrees. So go figure. And that means A point. It doesn't mean anything to do with selenasian. So what? Um, this is a cephalometric database. Um, this book, and we use it, it's the best we got. It's the closest to the pre-industrial samples that we have. But hardly anybody uses it. Most people use something called a Steiner base. So we put the Bolton profile on our patients before we treat them. And this is, you know, 2 through 18 years old we have them for. And that's where we want them to be. It looks better, and it promotes better breathing. So what? Oh, no sound? Okay. How do we get sound? Uh, is it... Is our sound guy here? No? I'm losing time. Do I get more time for this? Oh, it was muted. Or was it muted? No, tell me. No, no sound. No sound? Is it on the computer? More time. I want two more minutes, please. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I'm not going to have sound. But it, it worked, didn't it, before we started? I don't know what's wrong. Oh, well, I'm going to tell you what it says. This is from the BBC. And they're saying that our, uh, we're losing our molars. And you can see from this that we're not losing our molars, right? There they are. There's not room for them. We're not losing them. And they're saying our brains are getting smaller. And that's where I put that in there. So, <laughs> so the narration with the English I should have had Mike do that. Uh, so anyway, origins of, we're not the first to be looking at uh, this as being uh, an anthropological problem. Um, and, you know, Aaron asked some great questions about what, what are anthropologists and evolutionary biologists? Are they interacting more in England than they are here? There's only a handful of dental anthropologists uh, worldwide, I think, you know, relative to the whole body. And there's just... It's starting to really take off, though. Rick Robley is an orthodontist that I'm working with sometimes and lecture with. But so what? Oh, you know, we got to have sound. I'm sorry. Is, is, can this be fixed? I mean, this, this is like my whole talk. <laughs> um, and again, if I can't have more time, then I can't waste it. But it is what it is. Uh, I don't know what happened.
what do they call this injury time in soccer? Like at the end of, at the end of the match, do I get a little bit extra? Still no sound. But I don't really care about that one. Okay. Okay. Good. Scientists think we are also losing our wisdom teeth and surprisingly that our brains We're are losing getting space smaller. for them. The average volume of the human brain has decreased from 1,500 cubic centimetres to 1,350 cubic centimetres in the last 30,000 years. 30,000 years is not a long time in evolutionary time. It's often thought of as cute. So parents with the videos on YouTube, their tiny children snoring. But today's study raises the question, could a pattern of noisy nights be linked to behavioral problems down the road, like attention deficit disorder, hyperactivity, and could any of it be prevented with a good night's sleep? Snoring is actually a red flag. It is a hallmark for problem breathing at night. Today's study followed more than 11,000 children for seven years. Those who snored, breathed through their mouths, or had apnea, long pauses between breaths, were up to twice as likely to develop behavioral problems by age seven. So what comes first, the large tonsils or the posterior positioned soft palate, which is attached to what? The hard palate, which is what? The maxilla. Maxillary retrusion, when we fix that structural problem, kids' snoring goes away. When kids get their tonsils and adenoids out, if they get their jaws widened and brought forward, they're less likely to have relapse after their TNA surgery. So, so what? And that's the big so what. Dystrophic jaws, a term I got from Mike, and faces are comorbid. They coexist. They're not necessarily cause and effect, but they're almost always seen together. Increased respiratory and neurological health risk. Okay, so what we say is let's get the structural problems off the table early. Orthodontics usually begins about nine or ten uh, in, in Europe and America, everywhere. I'm treating two and a half year olds, ladies and gentlemen. Two and a half year olds are being referred to me by pulmonary physicians. Orthodontists used to give me so much grief. You treat too early, Boyd. You're using up the orthodontic benefit. All these, not in, but since most of my referrals are coming because of respiratory-related issues, and I'm not saying I'm going to cure them. I'm saying I'm going to take off malocclusion as being contributory to comorbidity with respiratory problems. That's all I say. I'm a dentist. I'm just doing dentistry. Uh, so this is just out like a month ago. And, uh, you know, or June 7th, yeah, a month ago. Association of long-term respiratory uh, diseases with removal of tonsils and adenoids. This is not without consequences. This is the gold standard for how you deal with sleep apnea in children. You take out their tonsils and adenoids. There's a reason for tonsils and adenoids, okay? Let's try to make them shrink. Do stuff with their diet. That's one thing that causes it. And change the structure. Get the soft palate out of the way and help them become habitual nose breathers as early in life as possible. Stephen Stearns, most of you know him. He's an evolutionary biologist at Yale. He is very much involved in this. So what? Dystrophy, okay, dystrophic faces. You don't maybe not have to take out the tonsils and adenoids if you can do structurally something. Non-surgical distraction, we call it, okay? Post-operative, uh, 500,000 a year Tonsils and adenoid surgeries are done on children. And these are not without consequences, especially when they're under three. They get admitted, they can even die. You know, that's very rare, but they can have significant morbidity after surgery. So we want to minimize the need for this as being the gold standard for sleep apnea in kids. Now this is the talk I'm giving in Salt Lake City uh, next week, a few weeks. There we go. Back of the face is the airway. Front of the airways of face. You can't separate them. There's the adenoid. I want to get rid of this term craniofacial. It's craniofacial respiratory. It's one complex. Do not talk about one without the other. It's not scientific. This is what we're found. Look at that. Did you see that? That is a baby in utero. I'm treating that kid now. I diagnosed that kid at 20 weeks gestation, and I'm treating, he's four now. Uh, compared to one of our pre-industrial skulls. Look at that. That's a fetus. That was a stillborn fetus that, that died uh, about 200 years ago. And I've got lots of them. 
and they all have forward jaws. So this in, in utero retronathia is something that's pretty new. So this is something we've developed. Uh, it's an acronymed assessment tool um, that screens for not just behavioral risks like tooth grinding, bedwetting, snoring, mouth breathing, sweating, moving around a lot, can't wake yourself up in the morning. Those are all behavioral traits. These are physical traits. Most of the physical traits that are associated or comorbid with sleep disorder, breathing, or, or apnea in kids are above the neck. So who's better to assess it, right? Dentists? No. How about school teachers? I mean, all you got to do is look at the kid. You don't even have to be a clinician. And I'm going to go over these real quick. Um, even with my extra time, I'm sure I'm going to run it up to the end. Uh, so the, and this is a, 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 a tool that they have at Harvard. And they had developed one. They saw me lecture on this at Boston University in the spring. And they said, we have to combine ours and validate it at Harvard. So we're in the process of applying for IRB um, to do, do this at, at Harvard's uh, dental clinic with sleep medicine because some of the things overlap, but mine has more pictures. Uh, so this is underway. Judy Owens is head of the pediatric sleep medicine at uh, Harvard, and she's very interested in developing this with us. Okay, this is before and after airway anatomy. And, of course, I'm from Chicago, so I got to choose the acronym. Uh, tooth grinding or bruxism. These are all scientifically validated physical traits that are known to be comorbid, maybe causative uh, risk factors for sleep apnea in children. High vaulted palate, you can see the difference. That's a pre industrial normal. Eye appearance, venous pooling, those are dark circles. And then you shouldn't see any whites of the eyes. That's flat cheeks. That's a retronathic maxilla, maxilla, but they don't have a dental underbite, so a lot of orthodontists miss it. Anterior open bite. And I'll, you know, you're going to all get my slides, but it's good to print these out, and you can use them if you're a speech pathologist, a health coach, a dietitian, anybody that has uh, opportunities with children, you can be doing this, and you might be the first person to recognize some of these problems. Okay, so here's a, a well-balanced face. Point A is on that line. And I showed you in the pre-industrial skulls, it's ahead of that line. You know, this was written, what, in the 80s? McNamara is a god in, in uh, orthodontic, ac academic orthodontics. Uh, Bill Prophet, these are guys that, they're brilliant, brilliant guys, but they're, they're operating on norms that were developed in the 50s by post-industrial white kids mostly. So what? Normal does not equal healthy. This is what I talked about on the dental panel last year, if some of you were there, that normal doesn't mean healthy. And I cited the example of blood pressure. Hunter-gatherers, these are Americans. Look how much lower these are. So this might be our genomic potential. This is okay for an industrial society, but we perhaps should be even lower. Um, this is, you know, this SNA angle. Um, that I was talking about from where the pituitary is to where the nose is to that point under your nose. You know, they're calling 79.5. You know, that's normal for a, a five-year-old, I think. Well, we've got four, five, six, three-year-olds, uh, kids that died uh, before the Industrial Revolution or during the Industrial Revolution. And they're about 90. That's about 90 degrees here, which suggests that maybe we need to re- do these norms, especially in light of the fact that kids whose faces are back, back of the face is what? What's the back of the face, anybody? The airway, the airway thank you. So this is um, orthotropics. Uh, it means correct growth. Correct meaning growth that's conducive to habitual nose breathing uh, during wakefulness and sleep for a lifetime. It has to be implemented in l early life. It's very difficult to do later on. Um, again, when does it start in utero uh, and it persists? So my learning objectives, this is what I gave in uh, France uh, about three months ago. And just, you'll have all these, I don't want to go over these to, to use my time, but you, you'll get my slides. Uh, okay, we did that. Here, okay, so I'm finishing with doing cases. Okay, how am I doing on time, timer? Miss, Miss Timer? Okay. 
10 more minutes and plus, plus overtime. Oh, good. Bless your heart. I love that. The World Cup relived. I was for Croatia. I love that goalie. Okay, so she was obvious. This was a blessing that this child had a dental underbite because a lot of kids have skeletal. Their bones are in underbite. Like the upper jaw is growing behind the lower jaw, but their teeth have compensated. So the upper teeth stick out. And most orthodontists, pediatric dentists, general dentists who do orthodontics, they get fooled by it. And they say, well, there's no underbite, so this isn't really a class three, which is you know, the classification system that was in the 1900s uh, for white kids. Um, and it, it just totally uh, doesn't, it, it's based on teeth. It doesn't really base much on jaws. But what we worry about, and this is a point, again, Dr. McNamara figured this out in the 80s, that this point called pterygomaxillary fissure in the posterior nasal spine, in kids who have skeletal class three maxillary underbites, that line is very small, okay? And it tends to coincide with, with small airways. This kid was massively crowded. The permanent centrals, she was four and a half maybe when we started her. Uh, the centrals were completely rotated, canines completely blocked out. This will never recover. So what this suggests is she doesn't have enough room for her permanent teeth, everyone would say, but no, her tongue. Her tongue can't go up there. If her tongue had been developing her maxilla from inside in utero, and then the first two, three years of life, you'd see spaces there. And that, that's, it really does, it starts early on. Um, these are, this is the pediatric sleep questionnaire of all those things like snoring, mouth breathing, grinding the teeth, bedwetting, open mouth breathing. Mouth breathing is the most, one of the most serious things um, that we aim to correct. And I do, this is a validated questionnaire um, for behavioral traits, not physical. So I combine it with physical traits. And then here's how, this is John Mew's stage one appliance. It's got hooks to hook up a face mask so that the kid will expand laterally, and at night it pulls the upper jaw forward so the tongue actually, uh, the mandible can bring the tongue forward off the back of the throat when they're laying down uh, and while they're awake. We also expand the lower jaw, uh, very easy to do. Best kept secret in orthodontics, little kids are the best patients in the world because they want to please their parents. And if their parents are shelling out the bucks and bringing them here, believe me, the parents want to be pleased. So I, I'm a pedodontist. I'm not an orthodontist, nor do I play one on TV. Okay, pediatric dentists have loads of training in managing fears, anxieties, and expectations of children and their parents. Orthodontists do not have this, and they're still, they're never going to get it because it's not part of the curriculum. That's why most orthodontists come out of school saying, don't start till they have almost all their permanent teeth in. How come? They didn't spend one minute in my department when I was doing pediatric dentistry at Iowa in the 80s. I spent hundreds of hours in their department. So I pretty much know most of what they know, if not more so because of the airway component. And they haven't a clue how to manage anxiety of kids and their parents. So that's about to change. And you'll see on my very last slide why it's about to change. Um, so anyway, we, we fixed obviously the dental uh, underbite. Um, but more importantly, we fix the, the, the skeletal underbite. That's how it works. Watch what happens here. The posterior nasal spine comes forward in the anterior. So this whole maxillary complex comes forward, and it pulls the soft palate off the back of the airway. Huh? Go figure. Non-surgical maxillomandibular advancement or, or uh, non-surgical uh, distraction. Okay, so uh, Brett just looked at his watch. I, I'm thinking he's hungry for lunch. So, okay, so here, look at the difference in her face, okay? And all those yeses turned into no's. Every one of those pro problems went away on her. I'll go through these real fast, but this is just incompetent lips. You can see his airway. That area there is where his adenoids are. All those yeses on the pediatric sleep questionnaire. We expanded him. We protracted him. Got rid, uh, and look at this, look at that. I mean, that doesn't happen with growth. That kid was slated to have his adenoids out. He didn't need to do it. The, the adenoids didn't change in size. I just brought the soft palate forward. If I can do it, anybody can do it. You just gotta 
know how to understand and work with children and be patient. And like Mike said, it's not a huge money maker. You stay in longer with these kids. But they send all their friends to you, so you make up for it in volume. Um, this is a kid. I didn't even do orthotropics per se. She was older. Look at her chin, okay? All I, and look at all the yeses, especially the mouth breathing. That's one we pay most attention to. And look what happened to this child just by expanding her. Look at the chin, okay? I didn't even put her in a face mask. Look at that airway. And look at all those yeses turned to noes, okay? This is what we can do with orthotropics. And it's, you know, the aesthetic results are fantastic. The, the, the benefit that you have on their, their face, their, their breathing. How am I doing? That's the last slide. Okay. I get, is that five minutes for questions or five minutes to talk? Oh, my God. Okay, I'm going to go back. No, we can, we can have some more time for discussion. So, anyway, the Hippocratic Oath, do not retract. Do not delay treatment. Okay, I say give a kid the best possible airway at the soonest age as is feasible. And that means you have got to diagnose these kids maybe while they're in utero. But, to, you know, that's a little out there. But certainly, you know, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry said all children should have their established a dental home by age one. Well, that is, a, you know, okay, they don't even barely have many teeth. Okay, no cavities. Gums are healthy. You look for lip tie. You look for tongue tie. You all know about that? The little piece of skin that holds your lip. And those are all things that can predispose kids to a lot of problems. Um, and also look at the airway and ask questions. So I'm all about doing that. Um, shucks, there was one slide in there that I wanted to promote. The American Dental Association on August 23rd is going to have the first pediatric airway symposium. This is, this is landmark, the American Dental Association. They pretty much set standards for the entire world. And they are saying that dentists need to get involved, pediatric dentists primarily, because that's the specialty that sees the most kids. But orthodontists need to be seeing kids sooner. General dentists who see kids need to be seeing them sooner and need to be evaluating them for airway health risk. So um, if anybody is interested in knowing more about this, just go to the American Dental Association's uh, website. And it, it may be sold out, but if people want to go, they're, they're probably going to get a bigger room. Um, but there's as many physicians. I'm speaking on, uh, on one of the days, which is a huge honor. Um, highest honor ever I've gotten to speak at the American Dental Association. Um, and several pediatric sleep physicians are going to be there. So uh, it's a, it's a three-day, actually, event. So, um, Well, that's all I have. Good. Wow, I've never finished early in my life. No. Is that, was I in overtime? Thanks, Kevin. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going home tonight like, staring at myself in the mirror wondering what else went wrong in my life <laughs> for like two hours probably. Um, please line up at the microphone for questions. Okay, there you go. Hi. So thank you. That was awesome. You're very welcome. And I'm um, curious to find out what recommendations you would make to women who are thinking about getting pregnant. Don't drink a drop of alcohol. When you make the decision to, um, I want to get pregnant, and your partner, don't drink a drop of alcohol. You guys, abstinence. There's new research coming out of Cal Berkeley. There's a book called, Why Do We Sleep? And this research is so solid that there should be no alcohol on board. And don't be around secondhand smoke, and certainly don't smoke. Um, and sleep. You need to breathe through your nose while you're pregnant in utero. Now, this is what a new concept is that if women do not breathe habitually through their nose as, as much as they can while they're pregnant, the fetus is getting a signal that it's about to be born atop Mount Everest. Now, this is a hypothesis based upon the Barker hypothesis, which suggests that babies will adjust their metabolism based upon what the placenta is telling, like starvation during the Dutch hunger winter, thrifty phenotype it's called. The baby's going to trap every calorie, you know, because 
throughout evolutionary history, you were programming yourself in utero for a lifetime. I mean, if, if you were born into a famine, that might last 30 years. Well, maybe you weren't going to live that long. So you had, well, it's the same thing with oxygen. Oxygen, I, I, my master's is in human nutrition. Now, we learned that not only macronutrients, micronutrients, phytochemicals, trace elements, there's one other nutrient. It's called oxygen. It's a nutrient. But unlike the other ones that I just said, like the flight attendant says, put the mask on yourself, then help your kid, the placenta does the same thing. Mom has priority over oxygen, over the fetus. Okay, and the fetus is already growing in a low O2 environment because of cardiac, the way the cardiac system is developed. It requires low O2, so they don't have a margin of error. You deprive them of a, a little bit of oxygen for a little bit of time, and it can lead to intrauterine growth restriction and preterm delivery. And that affects not only the long bones, but we think it could be contributing to why the face is shrinking. Is, and it's not all the mom's fault. Men have to take care of their sperm. Women get all the blame. It's not fair. Uh, so there, I gave you probably more than you want to know. Hi there. Hey. Uh, I just want to thank you for the talk. Super okay. interesting. Um, uh, I've really become fascinated with, with the dentistry aspect of ancestral health since, since the panel last year. And so I'm just fascinated. Um, I actually, I wanted to tell you a story. Um, I was really blessed to have an amazing uh, oral hygienist who has retired and in her retirement has become a maxillofacial therapist. Wow. Where, 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 is she, where are you located? Located in the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to find out who she is. I'd, I'd love to put card. you in touch yeah. with her. Yeah. Uh, she uses buteco breathing. Yeah. That's, there's, who knows buteco here besides Mike? I mean, yeah. I mean, he's Pat, Pat McCune is a, a good friend, and that's, that's great. I'd love to know who she oh, is. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'd love to put you guys in touch. Um, and she gets results in all of these symptoms that you're talking about just using breathing exercises, tongue exercises, uh, like without surgical intervention. She's yeah. seen decreases in ADHD symptoms and things like that, and it's really amazing. What's her name? Uh, Ginny. Yeah. And uh, I'll, yeah. I'll get her contact info and yeah. deliver it I'll, to you and to Mike. Yeah, I'll give you my as card. Well. That's great. Um, Scott Solomon is a dentist from uh, Connecticut, and he was on the dental panel last year. Scott, will you stand up so they can see who you are? So if people have questions, he's also very knowledgeable in all this stuff. So uh, great. Hi. Hi. Hey, great talk. I apologize. The dental area is new to me, and I missed the talk earlier. So I'm just curious on the other evolutionary things of you know, dietary lifestyle. Is there evidence out there, like she was asking, for prenatal diet yes. or yes. children's diet? Yes. I just, I I'll, I'll give you my card. You can email me. Okay. I have a whole lecture on prenatal wellness, and it's more than pregnancy yoga. That's good, and it's more than avoiding mercury and fish and taking your you know, folic acid or folate, whichever one you're supposed to take. It's sleep and breathing, sleep and breathing. The way the mom sleeps and breathes, there's tons of literature on this in the OB-GYN literature. So. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much. I'm a psychiatrist. I send a lot of my patients for sleep studies. I'm an adult psychiatrist. Yeah. Um, they get a lot of CPAPs and then those $3,000 really expensive devices. Do you think they'd be better off with orthodonture and breathing? Well, in conjunction with CPAP. The goal of CPAP is to get them off CPAP, but they don't know that and most people don't say that. First of all, most, most people don't wear them. But if you get with a dentist who really knows what the hell they're doing, that where are you located? Boston. Boston? You're good. I mean, I can, I can help you set up, because I'm doing work at, you know, with Boston University mainly, but also a little bit with uh, Judy Owens. But if you can get them in a mandibular repositioning device, because that CPAP saves their life, but boom, what's it doing? It's keeping the, the jaws back because of, of that pressure. So there, some people, there's no way, there's nothing you can do for them in terms of they just, they're, they're condemned to CPAP. But there's a lot of adults that actually can be weaned off of CPAP or at least less pressure. So I'd love to help you with that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do I have any more time? Because I could give it to Mike because Mike, I, I, he, he had a follow Does anyone have questions for Mike? Still. I'll give Mike the mic. I don't know. I think we've kind of wrapped up. 
I, I, if you want, I can take a few questions, but I think, you know, sorry, Kevin, it was your moment at the moment anyway, but I think what me and Kevin are saying is, you know, similar things on slightly different lines, but it, it's, it, it's a very, un, so something people aren't aware of. You, you know, I'm turning around to you all and saying, more or less, all of you are quite affected. You know, who have got 32, who here has 32 teeth in their head? Yeah, not the majority, is it? Yeah, and most of you didn't aware that that was abnormal. Any, any questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>